Hello, I'm John Neff, Global Editor-in-Chief of Motor One, and welcome to this week's episode of the MotorOne.com podcast. Christmas is right around the corner, and we've been comparing our wish lists among the editors and writers of MotorOne.com. Not surprising, we all want a lot of car stuff. Performance parts, accessories, tools, toys, and games. Our wants and needs run the gamut, and we'll be keeping our loved ones busy this holiday shopping season. On today's episode, we'll go through a few of our wish lists and share what car stuff we want most for Christmas. Joining me on this episode are writer Christopher Smith. Hello. How are you doing, Chris? I'm doing all right. And also with us is Chris Bruce. How are you, Chris? Doing great. How are you guys doing? Very good. As a reminder, I'm going to go by your last names, Smith and Bruce, just to make things a little easier. <laughs> sure does. <laughs> well, that's not confusing at all. Not at all. So uh, receiving Christmas gifts for me, I don't know about you guys, has changed as I've gotten older. I mean... When I was a kid, uh, it was the one time of year, aside from my birthday, where I got stuff. You know, kids don't have incomes. They can't go to stores uh, on their own and buy things. And, you know, when they do get money, it's like, you know, measured in single dollars. Uh, and, I, you know, when I was a kid, I thought I was rich if I had $20 to go buy something, or if not $10. But as you get older and you can buy things for yourself, you usually do that throughout the year. And there's a lot less to to ask for around Christmas. And then I find, you know, all the people who used to give me Christmas gifts now want to give gifts to my nieces and nephews and don't care so much about giving gifts to me. So I have to, I have to be, uh, wise and strategic when I want something for Christmas and, you know, make sure that it's the one or one, two or three things I really want from the people who still care enough about me to buy gifts. My, my, you know, parents or my, my wife. Um, so what about you guys? What's Christmas like in, in your houses now? Yeah, it's pretty much the same here is that I, you know, I get gifts from my parents, my mother-in-law and my wife, and that's kind of about it. So same thing though. I, you, I buy most of the stuff I want throughout the year. So it's actually sometimes hard to come up with a list because it's like, well, I kind of wanted this. So yeah, I guess I'll, I'll ask from it for that person. So yeah, it kind of takes the magic out of it because you, you almost have to scrounge up for the things that you wanted the least that you didn't uh, go out and just buy yourself. But I, I'm I'm trying to change that this year. I saved a couple, uh, a few things. What about you, Smith? What I I imagine Christmas in, Christmas in the Smith house is is fun. I've reached the point where I've, I'm mostly interested in giving out just you know yule tides and and gifts of do- of joy and happiness and and uh, you know not quite as materialistic i guess but um partly that's that's because i'm actually uh about 1200 miles away from really all of my family my wife and i live out here in in south dakota her family is in illinois my family's in michigan we generally don't make that travel back and forth and we never we never got around to having kids and I take the blame for that because I'm still a kid. So <laughs> you are I, a kid. I mean, I, I mean that's why I, mean, I, that's why I said I, Christmas in your house is probably really fun because you're a giant it, kid. It, you know, it is. But kind of like what you guys are saying, I, I mean, with just the two of us, I mean, we tend to buy the stuff that we want, you know, just, you know, when we want it, you know, when we can afford it through the year. So come Christmas time, it's always a it, it's a challenge to find something that. The other person doesn't just want, but, but, you know, kind of something from the heart, something that that's kind of touching. I've kind of, I've gotten a little soft in my old age. Yeah. You know, uh, my family, uh, like I have, I have two brothers and my parents, um, and some, you know, brothers and sisters-in-law. What we do now is a gift exchange where we're not all buying presents for each person, but we're, you know, pulling out of a hat. And we, we actually have started um, a different theme every year. So like one year, it'll be a gift exchange where everything has to be made by hand. Another oh, thing. Idea. Yeah. Another, uh, another thing, it'll have to be thrifted or yeah. So we have themes every year. Uh, and I really like that because it's, it's, it not only is it like, it doesn't break the bank for anybody, but there's a lot more or thought put into it uh, for sure but and uh, we do something like that with uh, with ornaments though it's it's not really gifts it's just it's an ornament exchange oh that's so, a good idea we always so, get an course, ornament when we go on vacation uh, like wherever we go we get an ornament right. for a tree and and you know there's some creativity there of course um my family back in michigan the people in michigan know all about browner's christmas world in frankenmuth it's the biggest christmas store right. in the I've world heard of that. it it literally is the biggest christmas store in the world so they always have these just fantastic ornaments and and of course being so yeah, how far do you compete away, with that <laughs> you know I, I jump on you know we jump on skype so we do it on skype and uh, so we can see and yeah it's like i've got you know like stuff from walmart 
<laughs> well, you do have the entire internet at your disposal too. I I, I do, but uh, well, I and I have Mount Rushmore, you know, out here. There you go. I can get some cool Mount Rushmore gifts. There so. you go. Well, I wanna I wanna go through each of our Christmas wish lists because I know we do each of us uh, out of out of our entire you know writing team. Uh, each of us have uh, kind of a wish list we've put together of a few things that we want this Christmas of things that are car related. So. Uh, Bruce, why don't we start with you? What is on your list for Christmas that's car related? I very doubt I will get this simply because of the expense. But uh, so Anki, the wheel company, they make a, uh, a wheel called the Comp, C-O-M-P-E. And they essentially look like mini lights, if you're familiar with those. And I would really like them for my mini. I doubt I'll get them, though, because I would also they're 16 inches. I've got 15s on the mini now, so I would need tires as well and then a place to put my 15s, which would probably become winter wheels. But uh, I sent you guys a picture of them. They look really cool. They're they gun do. metal. They, they do. And they're not crazy. They're 184 each. So they're not crazy expensive by wheel no. standards. But then once you add tires onto that. Right. But I have been lusting after these for a couple of years now. Um, and they, they kind of look like a, um, a, a a version of those original first gen mini wheels that are finished in kind of like a matte gunmetal gray. Yeah, I know um, exactly. Yeah, yeah, really, really tight looking wheels. But yeah, you're right. When you get wheels, what I assume everybody who gets wheels also gets tires because the well, I don't pro- know how you're going to use wheels without well, tires. Well, I mean so. the, the the process. Uh, well, assuming you can't like do do people ever like. Um, take the tires off their current wheels and put them on new ones if they're the exact same size wheels. Yes. Yes. I met, but I imagine, <laughs> I imagine some people do, but that's also a huge pain in the ass. As I well. have many times, but for many years I worked in a place where I had access to a tire machine. So ah, there it wasn't any really, it wasn't really any big deal, but even after that, I mean, you know, good example. You know, I, I got some wheels on my uh, on my Mustang a couple of years ago. I still had a good set of tires on the old wheels that I had, so I just took it over to the tire shop. Hey, can you guys switch these around for me? It was like fifty or sixty bucks to switch the tires versus paying probably six hundred bucks for a new set. So. Right, right. But in this case, Bruce, I think this is. I think you could make an argument. This isn't a gift or a present. This is like safety equipment because you can get snow tires for your old wheels sure and use those in the winter and the argument is you know everyone should have a set of snow tires in ohio so well i'll give you my wife's number and you can (laughs) call her and explain that to her and we'll see how this goes i'm sure that'll go great i'm sure that'll go just um, that'll work perfectly so smith what's your first item on your list like everybody, there's the things that will probably never happen, and I, I would probably start my list with uh, uh, a nice little group of go fast parts for the uh, for the Mustang. Just to, to remind everybody, I've got a '95 GT in the garage. It's a project car, and it's the last year for the old school five liter. And you know, a, a nice set of aluminum, uh, you know, like a, like a, some GT40 heads or, or, or some aluminum upgraded heads. That takes that cuts a little bit of the weight off the front, and it also really just helps that engine breathe better. Pair that with probably like an E303 cam and a and a, like a like a Edelbrock or maybe a GT40 intake. That would get me up probably about three 350 naturally aspirated horsepower. It's all I need in that car, but it's it's probably about a fifteen hundred dollar package. Everything that I want. Ooh, ooh. Well, how modified is the engine already, or would this be your first like? uh you know suite of of engine modifications it's i mean it's very basic um i have just a very inexpensive cold air intake um which replaces kind of the just the mess that engine was really crammed into the engine bay of the right. sn95 so um the cold air actually really it just kind of straightens everything out so a little bit of better flow through there um it's not really engine related but i mean i've got a full exhaust system on it which which helps get the air out better um, that's, uh, gosh, that's really it. As far as the engine mods, everything else is well, just, better, you know, better breathing is, is always a good first mod to start with. Oh, that's, that's always where you should start. And, uh, I mean, I did a dyno day, what, about a month, month and a half ago. And, um, I, I think I turned about 250, 255 at the at estimated at the crank. The wheel horsepower was something like 216 or 218, somewhere around there, which, the car was originally rated at 215 at the crank, so hey, I'll take wow, it. Wow, yeah, yeah. Well, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what. We'll do something for you a little cheaper that'll give you the same results. We'll get you some stickers from <laughs> the manufacturers of the parts that you can put on the front fender and just line them up. You know, just don't pop the hood. No one, no one will ever know. But yeah, I, 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 well, actually, 
the way it sounds, that I'll be honest, the car sounds mean as hell. It's, I mean, I've got a nice. See, loud it's all about exhaust. the impression you make. It it scares deer. I, I don't have any <laughs> deer run out in front of me. It's like there's deer down at the, uh, you know, right at the end of the headlights. I can see the deer, so just you know, take it out of gear, rev it up, deer runs away. <laughs> Or maybe they just see the Mustang and they're like, oh, crap, run. Right. Yeah, that could be it, too. People um, do that a lot. So my the, the first thing on my list is kind of a tradition I have with my mother-in-law because I also am a giant child. Um, and Lego is very popular in my wife's family. My, uh, my father-in-law collects them. All the nieces and nephews are into Lego. And I'm into Lego, too. So, of course, um, you've probably heard the Lego Batmobile recently came out. And this is the 1989 version, the, um, the Michael Keaton Batmobile, which is, to me, the, the best Batmobile. Um, and this is a very expensive set, but like it's 200, right? Yeah. It's like two, I, I, I don't know, 200 or 250. It's not cheap, wow. but my, I have this kind of tradition where my, uh, uh, mother-in-law will get me a, uh, one of the large Lego sets each year. And kind of the deal is she gets to keep the little free Lego set that, that you get when you order something over $50. Uh, but th so this year there's going to be a little bit of a conflict because the little set you get when you order the Batmobile, the big Batmobile is you get a little Batmobile mm -hmm. and I don't want to give up the little Batmobile. <laughs> so, and I just looked, it is two fifty. Yeah. So I, so we're going to have to have a talk about who gets to keep the little Batmobile. Tis um, the season to give John. Yeah, Come on. I think you might have to compromise on that one. You get the big one. I mean, it's over two feet what long. Just, that's a, that's a what, big boy. What I just heard you say, uh, Smith is. Tis the season to give to John, <laughs> which I agree. It is the season to give to John. And uh, what and the silly thing is, we're both collectors. Like my uh, my mother in law has. Uh, you you know how some uh, people collect like miniature figurines and stuff, and like mini versions of things and they display them yeah so my my mother-in-law has a display like that but it's basically filled with lego minifigs and it's on display right next to her front door in the living room um and and that's just she she finds them cool and cute and she has a nice collection going but uh but as most people who know me uh uh know as well i collect lego in the most annoying way which is i keep them in the box i never open them and they're sitting in a dark closet uh, waiting for what I don't even know. <laughs> but someday I'm going to pull them out and be like, I'm really happy I'd never put these together. That's so what I'm see, hoping I, at least. You had me at, um, you know, in the box. Hey, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm cool with that. It's it's kind of preserving the, the original state. But dark closet. You need to take over the living room, John. Yeah, Come maybe you need, I, space. you need some you need some I display do. cases, some track lighting. I can hook you up there. Track lighting. My my problem is my office. Uh, I just haven't done anything with, and I really need to put up some shelves. And if I did that, I could I could put the boxes on display. So maybe I, I can I can help you with shelves too, dude. I should ask for shelves <laughs> for Christmas. What the hell? Uh, there you should, go. Should have put that on my list. All right, let's uh, let's uh, circle back around, Bruce. What's your second uh, item, Smith? I think you'll be on board with this one. Uh, it is a model of the Toyota TS050, uh, that, which is their Le Mans car, and it's by the company Tamiya. And they're kind of the kings when it comes to modeling in terms of quality, at least in terms of cars. They, the quality is always just absolutely top notch from their stuff. They don't release stuff as much as often as other companies, but when they do, it's always worth it. Uh, and this thing comes out in mid-December, um retail is like 50 bucks essentially so it's not even that expensive but this thing looks like it would take ages to build mostly because it is just decals out the wazoo yeah, there, there are, are just so many like little decals on this thing to me i loves their decal like decals for speaker grills yeah you know yeah and it th this would be that and it looks like there's even like carbon fiber decals to like give that effect and th this is a type of model that would take me months to build, but when it's done, it would probably look amazing. But now, is is putting decals on uh, one of your favorite parts of putting together a model? Because uh, for me, that's the scariest part. Like it, that's it, that's the part where I'm scared I'm going to mess up. I don't mind it. My favorite part is painting, personally. But because um, it's that's kind of the part where you can kind of express yourself. Like you're like, I don't really like the idea of this color. I'm going to make it this color, something like that. But 
I could pro I could do it, but it would take a while. Um, but yeah, the, I, I, again, I sent you guys pictures. This thing looks fantastic. You're never going in, in die cast. You're never going to get a model that looks this good for sixty dollars. But building yeah, it, it would be a month long process. And this was this was a great card too because um, this is after they finally won Le Mans. Yes, this, uh, I should have mentioned it. This is the Le Mans winner. Yeah, yeah. So I remember the year before where they died on the last lap. Um, I think that was the year before, either one year or two year, two years before they won, mm-hmm. uh, which was just the most heartbreaking end of a Le Mans I've ever seen. Uh, but this was the one where they finally came back and did it. Although I, I feel like, and we're getting off topic here in terms of, of gifts, but I feel like Toyota finally won Le Mans because the competition level oh, they started totally going did. started going way down, especially mm-hmm. when Audi left. Um, but that's for another topic. Smith, uh, do you have any Tamiya thoughts? Do you like their stuff? I very much like their stuff. I've built I've built a few of their model kits. They are a little they're a little pricey, but when you when it comes down to to fit and finish, yeah, um, there's nothing. I, t- yeah, to me, you you really see the quality there. Um, and a little background: Bruce and I are both kind of model nerds. Yeah. So and and I mean I've I've built so many I can't even I can't even count them. Um, but the, having having things that go together really well. I mean, it, it sounds like an obvious thing, but it's like when you have a kit that, uh, you know, if there's just a little gap, uh, you know, between the parts now to really make it look right, you have to go in with a little bit of filler and it and it just adds so or much sand stuff ex- down or yeah, yes, it, just, it just adds so much extra headache to the process. Yeah. To me, as molds are a plus number one stuff. And yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's fun. So what's what's your number two then? <laughs> well, uh, speaking of, uh, you know, kind of nerd stuff, you know, I. I Grew up with G1 Transformers, and um, I think it w- well. It's been several years now since they uh, they came out with the masterpiece line. They figured, hey, these these kids from the '80s are now at a point where they can afford to spend hundreds of dollars for a toy instead of spending ten or twenty. So um, I have a few of the masterpiece Transformers already. Um, I've been wanting to get MP39 Sunstreaker, which um, that, that's the that's the yellow Lamborghini Countach. Oh, okay, yeah, uh, you know Very from nice. the original series. Um, and I mean, it's it, it it's one of the better looking ones in my opinion. It's been in my on my list for a while. I just haven't really gotten around to it. Um, and what are, what are or, the other ones you own already? Oh gosh, the Transformers, uh, <laughs> or you own a lot? <laughs> how long? How long do we want to go on the? Uh, <laughs> actually, I don't have that many uh, masterpiece. I've got, uh, I've got um, Hot Rod. They call him Hot Rodimus. Uh, uh, oh, since, the, yeah, the Hot Rodimus since, version. Uh, yeah, uh, Japan release. Um, uh, who else? I got Sideswipe. It's right behind me. I should just kind of turn my. See, John, this is why you need shelves in your office. I know. Yeah, I could have all so, this stuff right in front so of me. So I've got Wheeljack. How did I forget Wheeljack? The uh, you know the Lancia Stratos. Yeah, so, tell us oh, what yeah, cars you they are. That picture before. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, there's an article at MotorOne.com that I wrote about. Um. I think it was six or seven masterpiece transformers you should have, and they all happen to be ones that I have. So, ah. Okay. Well, we that, can. That, that was very convenient. I'll link to that um, in the uh, in the, yeah. the show description um, when I post it. Masterpiece Prowl. Um. Of course, you know the the Datsun. Um, you know, Japanese Datsun mm-hmm. and, and the Japanese uh, uh, police car uh, livery. Um, Got to have Bumblebee in there. Oh, yeah. The original little Volkswagen Bumblebee. Right. Um, who else I got? Ironhide, um, Trax, Corvette. I'm a big C3 Corvette guy. Um, and for there's fo- another one. Oh, as you say, for folks that don't know, explain what makes a masterpiece transformer a masterpiece. So. Anybody that remembers the original toys from the 1980s, of course, there was also the cartoon that marketed the toys and the toys sort of resembled what you saw in the cartoon, but the toys were very, very simple. The masterpiece line attempts to recreate how the robots actually looked in the cartoon and how they actually looked in their alt mode, their vehicle mode. So the transformations are exceedingly complicated in some cases they're larger overall they're all to scale um so when you stack up optimus prime next to bumblebee bumblebee is just like this little short guy next to prime of course you know prime was it was a big uh um if i remember correctly on international cab over i could mm-hmm. be wrong no freightliner maybe it's a freightliner cab over i could be wrong on that but that's really what separates the masterpiece line from from the original one and they just look fantastic they do. I actually, I'm looking at your, 
uh, slideshow of your collection that again, I'll post a link in the, in the show notes. Uh, these are so amazing. I mean, I would, uh, I'd love to have a shelf of these. That Stratos well. one is amazing. Yeah, like it, it looks is. like a very, very nice scale model. And then you realize, oh, it can turn into a robot too. Yeah. And well, it, and I love that one, especially because Wheeljack, the original G1 Wheeljack toy, he looked like a gorilla. I mean, his arms were literally touching his feet. And just the engineering, you know, I, I don't know how you even start right. figuring something out like this. You know, you know how the engineers, um, if they have engineers, I don't know. Like maybe they've they got to be really, engineers or something. I, I, I mean, just how complicated these transformations are. And I'm also, I'm, I've, I'm, I'm shopping as we talk here. I've, <laughs> uh, I've, 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 I've pulled up another screen for, uh, uh, for Mirage, which was. Um, the old, um, like, like, uh, is that the 935? Like, 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 like a Ligear F1 car, I think. Oh, okay. Blue, blue, Ligier. blue and, uh, yeah, Ligier. I, I, I can never get the pronunciation right there, but, uh, just the cool F1 car. They don't have him in the masterpiece line, but here's the thing. There's also, since the masterpiece line came out, there's a huge third party segment that offers these toys now. So there's a third party group, um, called Ocular. That uh, it's Ocular Max, I think, that offers a version, a masterpiece version of a uh, Mirage. That uh, I could use that one too. Damn it! <laughs> this Oof. wasn't a good topic, guys. So how much? How much does a masterpiece? How much does the one you want cost? Um, I think you can get Sunstreaker right now for about a hundred bucks, maybe a little bit over. That's um, not too bad for a Christmas present. That's not crazy. No, yeah, it, it, it's not crazy. Some of them, well, they just came out with a brand new version of Optimus Prime, I and saw it's that. like version three or four point oh, where it's like it's the real, 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 real version that they used in the cartoon, and it's just they went to extremes to like make it look, frankly, as bad as it looked sometimes in the cartoon. <laughs> How much does that one cost? Uh, I think that's like three or four hundred bucks yeah, now. You're starting to get up there. Optimus is always going to be the most expensive. Yeah, I still rather have MP10, the uh, um, the second release of Optimus. Yeah. Oh okay, yeah. Okay, John, we we got to throw it back to you. Okay, so my my second gift is way more on the practical side. So when we uh, when my wife and I bought the Tesla Model Three that we currently drive, we got the only available floor mats that that Tesla offered for the Model Three. And they weren't really the kind we normally like. They were they were really just flat ones that didn't have um, sides to them. Um, so even now, after a few months, there's uh, you know grit and dirt and things that are accumulating around the mat. And I take them out and vacuum up uh, up the carpet every once in a while. But since we bought our car, Tesla came out with uh, a new set of all-weather floor mats that have the really high sides, kind of like the really nice WeatherTech um, uh, floor mats. So I really want to get those because for some reason, I I just have to protect the carpet in cars. I When I get into a car, like if it's raining out, like I don't want to like get water on on like a carpeted floor mat or the carpet of a car. Um, I need to ask really quick. Do you have floor mats for your floor mats? No. Is that a thing? Oh, some people do. do that. Yeah, I, I do. I have I have rubber floor mats for my carpeted floor mats. Wow. No, I mean, if well, OK, f for our soul, we had carpeted floor mats. But when we got the rubber floor mats from WeatherTech, we took the carpeted ones out and we just stored them. So I didn't see a reason to keep those in the car still. Although well, they're we floor mats. They have to be in the car. I don't. I can't explain it. It's weird. Yeah, it's that sounds thing. like a. <laughs> that's like a. But it's. I have my mind. rubber floor mats for the regular floor mats. That's hilarious. Uh, I also learned recently that there are such there's such thing as a leather floor mat where oh, it's yeah. like it's like braided leather. And again, I couldn't. I, they look cool, and I you know I think rich people buy them for their cars that they don't really get dirty. But I I would I could never like again put a like a wet shoe on a um on a leather floor mat. To me, that would need another floor mat on top of it. What's Tesla charge for the the nicer floor mat? It's actually um a really good uh price. It's 195 and I think it includes both the two for the two front foot wells and one that goes across the entire uh rear seat. So that's a pretty good price for the it's full not, set. Yeah. And but nothing in the back, nothing in the cargo area. No, not the cargo area. That's okay. a separate thing altogether. Gotcha. Okay. All right, uh, let's go through one more round. Bruce, third pick. Sure. Uh, so this is another mini thing. This one, again, is far more affordable. This is an Ox 
AUX uh, input for the stereo. So since it's a 2006, it doesn't have that. So my current solution is just to turn my iPhone up really loud and listen to podcasts in the car. <laughs> that was the and worst, that, man. <laughs> and honestly, with an iPhone 10, that works okay. But yeah. it's still a little ghetto. But so, what 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 kind of stereo do you have? Does it even have the satellite stock, radio? What it came with? No. Do, so it and then it only has CD. I assume. Yes. Yes. Okay. So basically, you have AM, FM, and a CD player. Correct. Okay. Um. So and they, can you even buy aftermarket radios uh, or aftermarket stereos for that? Because it's like a it's a circular kind of kind of din is what they call it. Right. I, I to be honest with you, I've never looked because. Personally, I don't like the look of aftermarket stereos other than like the really like nice McClintosh ones. They all kind of look kind of chintzy to me. I just so, don't think it, it would look right in like the yeah, circular vintage looking housing of a mini. So, but yeah, so Mini originally offered it as an option when you bought it. But at the time, I'm like, what am I going to plug into there? It's 2005. Like, eh. <laughs> Little um, did you know. But yeah, so... The only so uh, I sent you guys the link. The part itself is only fifty bucks, but then it's not something I could install myself. I don't know wiring, so I would need to you know buy the part and take it somewhere and have it installed. And I don't know what that would cost. Probably not in nothing insane, but still. Yeah, it's pretty industrial looking, but uh, I mean, I, I couldn't imagine driving around a car where I couldn't like get music from my phone to the car somehow. Just turn up the speaker on your phone. That's what I do. I guess. Uh, <laughs> I'd rather I'd rather drive around with my earbuds in my in my ear. That's illegal. You can't do that. Is it? I think it is. Yeah, right. I'm well, pretty sure. Well, I I don't know. It's it used to be back in the day, but now with the uh, with headsets that people oh, have that's true because they were saying for the, yeah maybe it's not I yeah maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, so yeah, that's a simple one. Smith, number three for you. Well, not quite as simple. Uh, remember back when I said I was just still a kid? Yeah. Yeah. I, I've i been um, really using aggressively my my home-built racing cockpit that I have for my Xbox One X. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have the Logitech G920 in there. The wheel is actually getting really loose. Um, I'm having some concerns that it's going to give up the ghost pretty soon. So I've been considering getting a new wheel for the xbox rig and um the, you know the i love the g920 because you can get it with the uh with the six speed manual shifter add-on mm -hmm. and uh and th there are a few games that it works really well on do you manual shift when you're playing like four as a four yes um i don't always use the manual shifter the uh, the g920 has nice paddle, paddle shifters, shifters. I've, I've gotten really used to the paddle shifters um, but I'll, I will occasionally use the, the manual shifter. It's great for drag racing. Um, oh, I bet, when, yeah. I, when I'm, when I'm playing project cars Two, that has a really good uh, the, project cars Two is kind of like my go-to when I want a full on sim, because I think the, uh, the physics are a little bit better. Um, you have to work the clutch pedal carefully. Cause if you just downshift and drop all the clutch, you're going to lock up the rear wheels and spin out. So <laughs> it's, it has a little bit of that realism to it. Um, but you know, the Thrustmaster TX I think is is an upgrade. It doesn't have the, it doesn't have the uh, the separate shifter. It still has the paddle shifters though, but it's like a it's like a five hundred dollar wheel, you know. By the way, we glossed over homemade gaming rig, and I want to <laughs> I want to circle back to it because I, you know I've known you for years now, and I see I, above re I'm a kid. I well and, and but but there's still more to reveal because when I heard you had a homemade gaming rig, I didn't think much of it, but then I saw pictures and realized that you built your own. Uh, driving rig that also converts back into a coffee table so that it can live in your living room full time, right? Yes, it's it's a transformer. We have <laughs> we, it is a transformer. It's a masterpiece transformer. No, it's not a masterpiece. It's definitely a sketchy. We one. It, we've we've talked about this briefly in the past, but we have got to get you to do a build series or or a how to on how to build your own gaming rig that turns into a coffee table. Because I, I, I need I to build that. a new one because this one is now probably what three or four years old, and I've had to repair it a couple times. I see some areas where I need to uh, make some improvements. We'll we'll get the we'll get the website to pay for all the wood, <laughs> and you just put it together. And and we'll publish an awesome how to 
Um, yeah. And, and then we can, we can feature it with the, uh, Thrustmaster wheel. Exactly. Plug for Thrustmaster. Exactly. So. Wait, this needs to be sponsored. You shouldn't be paying for this. We will, we'll call Thrustmaster. I, I know I'm, I'm so stupid. I need to figure this stuff out, man. Exactly. All right. Well, I've got a third one as well. And mine's a little weird because I saw it on Facebook. It is a, um, let me try to describe it. It's a portable, smart, digital tire pressure gauge slash inflator. And I, it, it caught my eye. It was on a Tesla forum and I'm interested in keeping, you know, the tires of our cars inflated to get a uh, good efficiency. And I think range. most people yeah, are interested in keeping their tires inflated. In, well, actually you'd be surprised. As someone who had a flat tire literally yesterday, right. it's very important. You'd be surprised how many people I know who don't care. Uh, <laughs> but the reason I like this one is because basically it's, it's very small. It's like a, it's smaller than an old Walkman, you know, and it's you more showed like, us. And that's the thing that worries me about it. It I looks know. too small. It, it, it well, and, and the, it looks too small. First of all, it's not corded. So it's wireless. It's, um, and it, so it's got a battery that powers it. And you, you, you just put it on the, the, the tire. Um, what do you call it? I'm blanking. You put it on the stem, tire stem. The and, valve stem. Yeah, the valve stem. And you set the PSI you want and you just turn it on and then it stops when it gets there and then you move it to another wheel and you go around that way. Uh, I like that rather than having to like, you know, uh, put some air in, then check, put some air in, then check, put some air in, then check. Um, but this thing, it's for one, it's $40, which almost seems too cheap. Yeah. And the only place I can buy it from is AliExpress, which is like a Chinese website. Yeah, it's Alibaba. Yeah, and the brand name is Xiaomi. It's the Xiaomi Mia. So it's very like Chinese. I have no idea where this is so coming you've from. Gone, you've hit four red flags. It's too oh. small. Well, maybe five. It's wireless, which seems weird. It It's from AliExpress. Red flags all over the place. <laughs> yeah, but here's the thing. I have a, a tire, something similar to this, that you can set the pressure that it does all that, and it plugs into the cigarette lighter. Yeah, see, I and don't want that. I think you got to go that way. I don't even though. know if the mo- the Model 3 doesn't even have a have a 12 volt. Oh, really? All right. Yeah, well, not, yeah. Not, not, not my that big I know. concern, I mean, I'm looking at this now. My big concern that it, if everything works has advertised, it's still probably going to take like 20 minutes to add 5 psi. It's, it just looks way too small. I mean, I've I've had those little small air compressors that take uh, you know, that you can hook up and, and I mean, it might take a little while to air up a tire. If you have a, just a regular compressor at the house, I mean, it's like, you know, three seconds psh, and, right. I've, and I have air in the tire. Honestly, before using that, I would probably drive like three miles on a flat to the, uh, to the tire store and say, Hey guys, can you air me up a little bit? Which actually is what I did yesterday. Well, and, and yeah, I'm thinking I like, I want to, for the use case scenario, I want this for it. It's like, before we take the electric vehicle on a, you know, 100 plus mile trip, I want to make sure the tire is properly inflated, get the most range out of the vehicle. So, but you're right. It could take like a half hour to add two PSI to one tire <laughs> because this thing is so weak. I don't know. I mean, also, not, not, to, not to dump on the- your gifts. No, no, no. Your idea is sound. I just wonder if this is the product to solve it. It just seems too cheap. It just there, there just seems to be a lot of red flags with this thing. Although for forty bucks, take a gamble. Bucks, if it exactly. Doesn't Why work, not? Screw it. Why not? There, there you go, Bruce. Here's our mission. We need to find a better alternative for John on this. But you got to get, you gotta try to get max, the listeners out there to help. You got to try to match all the features: uh, cordless, wireless. Uh, you know, preset That's gonna be hard, PSI. That's going to be the hard thing. Yeah, I don't want wires. Um, so we'll, we'll see. So before we move on, um, I, while we've been talking about, you know, what's on our wish list for this Christmas, it made me nostalgic for, uh, past Christmases and thinking about when we were kids and we, you know, we got our toys for Christmas and all that. So, uh, I want to share what my best gift of all time was, and, and you guys can go, go after me. Uh, my best guest of all time, I remember, I can't remember the exact age. I'm thinking seven or eight, maybe. And I, I asked for this and and got to open it on Christmas Day. It was the G.I. Joe hovercraft oh, yeah. with uh, Cutter. Cutter was the G.I. Joe character that piloted it. The super big one, right? Not like the tiny, like... Maybe Correct. five inch one. Exactly. Okay. And that's why it's so memorable to me because I back in the day, like the G.I. Joe sets went all the way up to the aircraft carrier. Yeah. The aircraft carrier was like, what, 
five feet long. Probably. Yeah. That that was the it's largest. It's something I've only seen once in real life. And it was, it's still today shocking as to how big that thing is. Exactly. Like even as an adult, when you're physically larger, you're still like, oh my God, that is a large toy. So uh, the hovercraft was like on that, like like it was in terms of scale, like on that scale. Um, and it was the, but it was like one of just one of the largest sets I'd ever gotten. Um, and I just couldn't believe I got it. I probably still believed in Santa Claus back then. Uh, the problem was it was delivered when I opened it and took Cutter out. Cutter had two left arms instead of a right <laughs> arm and a left arm. So, uh, I got to write myself, like myself, my parents uh, had me do it. I wrote, uh, GI Joe or who, who made those Hasbro or I don't know. I forget which toy company made them, but. Um, I wrote a letter and, uh, you know, I didn't send cutter back. So they sent me a second cutter with two, two correct arms. Um, so I had, I had two cutters. Actually, if I, if I had kept the, the one cutter, the, the incorrect one, he'd probably be worth like 50 bucks now because, you know, with those yeah, toys with errors are always like, you know, end up being the ones that are most valuable. 50 bucks, maybe 5,000. Maybe, like maybe. I didn't so keep Some it of those, some of those are uh, really pricey. Like the uh, USS Flag, which was the aircraft carrier, which I may or may not have been pricing over the last year to see how much they are. <laughs> <laughs> you totally were. What uh, What about you? What was your uh, best Christmas gift that you can remember? Well, I, um, I'm i going to buck the trend here a little bit because we've talked about how much of a kid I am. Um, it's not the gift here that matters, but well, what came behind it. And I know my parents sacrificed like crazy so I could have all of these Transformers when I was a kid. Um, I think if I remember correctly, it must have been like 2011 or 2012, somewhere around there. Um, before my Motor One days, my wife bought me an Xbox 360 and I didn't want it. I hadn't asked for it. I was playing the PlayStation a lot. That was at a point, um, I mean, we we weren't super rich by any means. We're not super rich now, but things were tighter then mm-hmm. than they are now. And she had saved money out of her paycheck for the better part of a year. Wow. With the idea that she would get me that Xbox. And I've never, ever forgotten that. And the Xbox 360 is sitting literally two feet from me right now in my office. It doesn't really get played that much these days, but uh, it's something that I will have until I die. Wow. That's so cool. I love that. And now you're an Xbox person, right? You're not even a... That that converted me from Xbox because up until then, I was a PlayStation guy. I was a Gran Turismo fan. And uh, sorry, GT people, but you know there have been so many broken promises over the years with Gran Turismo. GT4 was the pinnacle. It went yeah. downhill from there. 100% and agree. I'm, I'm Team Forza. And I have my wife partially to thank for that and uh, and her very touching gesture. Oh, great story. So thank you, Michelle. I've never forgotten it. Great story. How about you, Bruce? So I will say real quick, best Christmas gift ever was my Super Nintendo because there was a whole story behind it. But I will stick automotive themed on this. I And I actually can't quite pick one. It is either the Ghostbusters uh, um, hearse, Oh or, yeah, yeah. The old oh those those Ghostbusters uh, action figures back in the day were top notch. Oh yeah, and then I, I will let me get my other one. The other one is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles van. Oh, also yeah, your great era of of action figure and toys. I played with both of those a ton. I still have them in my attic. Um, my wife requested that we do a nativity scene with my action figures this year. So I was actually going through some of them um, and I found both of them. So th- your wife is awesome. <laughs> we just th- we need to stop for a moment. <laughs> but she well, to, to recognize your wife wanted to make a nativity scene with action figures. Yes. Yes. A thousand gallons of yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> so yeah, so it's got to be one of those two. I And I honestly can't pick which because they're both still so cool. They both still just look fantastic. And I played with them both so much as a kid. So either the Ghostbusters hearse or the TMT van. It's got to be uh, one of those. I remember. I have such good, uh, good memories of playing with those Ghostbusters toys. Those were uh, just super high quality, fun for the imagination. Loved them. Oh, yeah. 
All right. Well, let's uh, let's keep going. I wanted to um, our, our reader, uh, the reader comments on last week's episode were kind of quiet, but I think that was because we released the episode uh, Wednesday, which was the day before Thanksgiving. So not a lot of people um, uh, leaving comments when they're stuffing their faces with turkey. Uh, but the episode itself, which was me going toe to toe with Jeff Perez uh senior editor jeff perez about the tesla cybertruck it was a really good episode and we talked really deep into the weeds about the cybertruck and what it means in our reactions to it so i wanted to get your reactions to the cybertruck um because um we actually didn't get into as big of a conversation about the cybertruck in our chat room during the week as we did the mustang mach e that debuted a few days before so um, what about you guys? What are your thoughts on the the Cybertruck now that it's been out for a week and a half and we've gotten, I, it feels like we've gotten most of the stories uh, out of our system now. Uh, and now it's time to just sit with it and wait until Tesla makes the next move. I'll jump in right away and just say that that podcast was excellent. I mean, I thought you guys, I mean, you, there was, there were so many good points to say there. My personal opinion on the Cybertruck um, when it first came out, I was like, wow, this is a joke, right? And then five minutes later, I was like, it's not a joke. And then five minutes after that, for some reasons I couldn't really explain, I kind of really wanted one. And since then, I don't know if I still really want one. Um, but I mean, it's it's intriguing. It's, it's intriguing to say the very least. It's, there's nothing else that looks like it. Whether or not it will actually look that way when production ultimately happens there there's still some debate as to whether or not you know that that style can even exist uh, i don't think there are any specific requirements like like through the uh uh us department of transportation that outlaws any specific design elements there obviously there are no mirrors you need better lights better reflectors um i i, I don't know it's it's just one of those designs where it's like, it's not even whether you love it or hate it. It's whether you hate it <laughs> or you just can't look away from it. You know, you know what I mean? Yeah, no, that's, a, I think that's actually a great uh, place to put kind of the fulcrum of opinions, which is you either hate it or you fall into this camp of people who range from, you know, loving it to just can't stop thinking about it or, or looking at it. Um, yeah, I, I can't stop thinking about it right there. Yeah, yeah. How about you, uh, you Bruce? What was your reaction to it? And what do you think about it now? So I am intensely on the fence about this. I still wonder whether this is where Tesla should have put its effort. And I say that because so my dad is the shop foreman at a, cons a construction company that specializes in bridges. So his job is he either buys like their trucks or equipment or sends it out to be repaired. And at least at that company, they haven't even fully embraced Ford's aluminum pickups yet. Like they're still a little bit on the fence about that. So the idea that Tesla is going to enter this market, I just don't know if they are going to appeal to the, the the kind of industrial construction type fleet buyer. And and I don't know. I will say that the design is striking. I, the, That's you, a good word for it. You can't call it. In my opinion, you can't, it's hard to describe it any other way. Um, but. I am gonna. I'm gonna take a step back and just kind of see what happens with it when it finally arrives and we see the production version. Because, like Smith was saying, things are certainly going to have to change about that design. Yeah. Um, now, whether that you know they have to be completely altered and it has like you know rectangular headlights, like you or something like that, we'll see. But I, I, I am very on the fence. I don't hate it by any means, but I'm also not going to rush out to buy one. So I'm, we'll see what happens. So this, this past week, we actually commissioned uh, one of our uh, favorite rendering artists to imagine a version of the Cybertruck, what it would look like when it reaches production, if they had to make kind of this whole list of, of changes uh, to make it production ready and legal. And some of those changes were like rounding off the sharp edges, adding bigger headlights, adding uh, side view mirrors and windshield wipers, even even smaller wheels, because the, the wheel tire package on the one they unveiled was extremely large and aggressive. Um, so I'll put a link to that in the, the show notes as well. 
uh, because I think that's really interesting to check out. And the only thing I'll add um, after listening to your comments, uh, especially yours, Chris, about you know uh, fleet operators and, and construction and those kind of um, sectors, how they're reacting to it or how they will. One thing that I've come to believe since uh, it debuted is that I don't think Tesla is trying to enter the the truck market as we know it today. I don't think they are planning, at least initially, to convert Ford truck buyers, Chevy truck buyers, Ram truck buyers, or people who buy trucks regularly. I think they are trying to create a completely new market of truck buyers um, that will pull from a lot of different areas. But obviously, uh, one big area are just you know, people who are um, really into electric vehicles and want to get to the point where electric vehicles have 400 and 500 miles of range. That's a huge accomplishment and opens up kind of some cool things that you can do with electric vehicles, uh, including towing. I mean, if you have a 500 mile range, you could probably tow, uh, if you're towing, you could probably have 300 miles of range depending on the size of the thing you're towing. So I, I think they will sell tens of thousands, if not more, cyber trucks without even pulling many people from from their current trucks um and by the time the, the that many cyber trucks get out into the market and people are using them i think then regular truck people will have gotten used to it or just seen it around and seen the reaction and reviews of it and then i think some of those truck people will start coming over but i think they will they will sell tens of thousands of people to tens of thousands to people who wouldn't have bought a truck in the first place um, had Tesla not come out with this particular one. I agree. So, but there's so many unanswered questions. I think that's what what Jeff and I ultimately rested on was like, we just don't even know if this is going to be the truck that that goes on sale. It's, you know, I have no doubt that it's Musk's intention to sell this exact truck. I just don't know if they can do it. Um, there's just, yeah, no, I, I, I think that's, that, I mean, that's a lot of the feedback that I've heard from people that I know that aren't necessarily Tesla fans. They're just like, he's, he's building this has a vehicle that you can buy right now. And it it's not, it's a concept car. It is. You know, it's a concept or, car that you can order. Or people, people have called it a prototype. Uh, yeah. but it really, he just hasn't answered how finalized it is. And I think that's like the one open question we're all hanging on. So, yep. all right. Well, we'd love to hear what you guys think about either the Tesla Cybertruck, uh, from the last episode or what you want for Christmas, um, or your favorite Christmas gift of all time. We'd love to hear that. So please leave your comments um, on the, the show post when we post it on Motor One, or you can find us on Facebook, of course, and Twitter and Instagram and all those places. Coming up after the break, we're going to talk about uh, the most interesting stories of the week. But before that, a reminder that if you're listening to this online, you can also get our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify, and Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts, you should be able to find us. So please hit the subscribe button now so you don't miss next week's show. All right, welcome back. Um, before we end the show, I want to go around the table and let's bring up uh, what we think was the most interesting news of the week. I kind of described you guys as if you're sitting with your your best friend or your dad at a bar, what's the one thing that happened in the car industry this week that you would bring up and make sure they knew? So, uh, Smith, why don't we start with you? Uh, you know, I'm a kid, so <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to We're going I'm back to say, video hey, games, look. aren't we? <laughs> there, there might be a hundred new cars coming to Forza Horizon 4. It's, you know, it's, yeah, I, I'm kind of a kid. So when I saw this news, I play Forza Horizon 4 a lot. We all CH do, I writing. think. Yeah, yeah, we're uh, we're all on there. CH writing, you might see me bombing around in my uh, in, in my old Ford Falcon or uh, uh, what else do I drive? Your PLP 50 with the. Uh, but my, my PLP 50 with the uh, super bike conversion on it. Yeah. So, I, and, and, you know, speaking of that, I'm all about the kind of interesting different vehicles i mean you see people driving they, they get their lambos and their ferraris one of the nice things about forza horizon 4 is there's such a, a diverse selection you can choose from i mean you can you can have various meetings and uh, and really explore some cars that you didn't even you wouldn't even think of to start with so i mean i'm just kind of looking over this list of potential 
cars. This isn't confirmed. This is this was leaked, I think, on GT Planet. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Bruce, you actually wrote I this. Did, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I mean, cars like um, uh, 2003 SVT Focus that, you know, that's interesting to me. Mustang SVO. Nobody, nobody loves the SVO, but me, it seems like. So if, if that makes it in there, awesome. Um, the Magnum SRT8, the wagon, you know, you know, cool stuff like yeah. that. There's, How there's about all the, kinds of great stuff. The 1998 Lincoln Mark 8. That's hilarious <laughs> I, that that's going to be in a racing game. Th- that would be that would be awesome. And, you know, there's a cult following for those there cars. Is. They have, they actually have some pretty decent performance. A, a 1990 Singer Porsche 911. That's a great, that'll be cool. Oh, that'll look gorgeous. I, I'm drooling over that one. And again, this is unconfirmed. Um, but also but there's has a list it, of about. Has it ever uh, happened that so many cars have been released in an update or or a package ever? I mean, this no, is a huge list. But. And there's a big but here. You have to remember, there was no Forza game for 2019. And the reason Ah. there was no Forza game is that allegedly Turn 10 Studios is developing the next Forza for Scarlet, which is the code name for Microsoft's new console. So that Mm. means Playground Games, that does the Forza Horizon series, needs to fill up a year's worth of content to keep people kind of interested in Forza until the new one comes out. And it's interesting that there's roughly, there's a little over 120 cars here, 10 cars a month for a year, that gets you to Scarlet. So, I don't know, we'll see, but there is at least logic in seeing why they would develop so many cars when they've got a year to burn and keep people interested in the franchise before the new one comes out. There's that's certainly sound logic. And I mean, traditionally, some cars have been released free. Some have been uh, in add on packs that you have to buy. Um, I Microsoft, I would love if all these cars were free because 84 BMW 635. Yes. I'd love if half of these cars were free. <laughs> <laughs> Chevrolet SS. Yes. The Mazda Speed 3. Yes. Porsche 928. Hell yes. Yeah, there's you're not even that. mentioning like the oddities, Mitsubishi Starion, Citroen DS. Like, there's some weird stuff in here. How about the 1981 Subaru Brat? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. I like. Okay, uh, I think my. I gotta step back. I'm getting excited. My favorite is this the, is why I'm talking about this this week. My favorite is the Ford Supervan Three, which was the in in 1994. I think it was the the van with the F1 engine mm-hmm. in it. Oh, that was gorgeous. There's also a Hennessy Velociraptor 6x6. That's the six-wheeled <laughs> uh, uh, version of the Ford Raptor. So, yeah, lots of lots of cool stuff. Um, yeah, uh, this may get me to finally buy and play the game with you guys. Uh, we're I thought you close. owned Forza 4. I don't. I downloaded it. I got the free uh, trial. Of yeah, it's, uh, it's on Pass. Game Pass. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But, uh, but then I deleted it again after that ended. Gotcha. And I'm, I'm well, back to I, see, I figured you'd Duty. be all over Forza because there's the Lego add-on. Yeah. I know. I know. No, it's close. I just I don't play tons of video games and I'm into Call of Duty right now. And so I'm like, I don't have bandwidth for a second game. I, I know what you mean. I mean, it sounds like I'm just playing nonstop. I, I really I'm not. I'm I'm OK. Well, maybe I'm You're, <laughs> you are. You are doing adult things. And <laughs> I, I, I do actually adult sometimes, although I did see you uh, on Facebook this weekend. Open your garage door with the intent of going out to uh, uh, snow blow your driveway and then immediately close your garage door and go back inside and play video games. Well, so, well, uh, hey, let's um, I, there needs to be a, some some added information there. There was three feet of snow in my freaking driveway. Yeah. Okay. Was- and and the winds were still blowing 50 miles an hour. I'm in Western South Dakota. We had a little blizzard. By a little blizzard, I mean literally we had a blizzard. Yeah, so. three feet is a little blizzard in South Dakota. So I cleared the driveway that evening and then the next day when the uh when the winds weren't ready to blow me down the entire state. All right, uh, Bruce, why don't we go to you? What um, what uh, piece of news this week had you talking or that you would want your best friend to know about? So this isn't n- news per se, but my wife and I were actually talking about this story last night. And again, it's what, something I wrote up, and it's about the couple that converted a Ford shuttle bus into an RV and set out to visit all of America's national parks. And it should be noted that they have two young children. What, as of the time of this, one of them was is like five and the other one was three. But when they set out, the one was like 18 months and then the older one was three. So really young kids. And sh- I... 
I had texted her during the day, we are never living in a van. And she didn't understand what that was about, understandably, because it's kind of a non sequitur. Uh, <laughs> and I, she came home and I showed her this story. And I'm like, this looks awesome awful and i'm not begrudging this family they are clearly very happy they are their their rv converted shuttle bus it looks very nice but traveling across america with two young kids who literally are sleeping in what looks like a closet and you in the like literally the same room as you it looks horrible. It well, let me, is not let me my ask, life. though, what uh, what about it do you not like? Is it the kids in particular or the or kids don't the help? But it's thing? not. So here's the thing. I lived. I am 34. I we bought a house a few years ago. I love my house. I lived in either dorm rooms or tiny apartments or whatever for years and I never want to go back to that. The small enclosed space for even if it was just my wife and I, even if it was just wife, dog, and I, I could never do it. Like we were sitting here talking about it. I said, where would we play ball with the dog? Like, cause right now we have room to do that. And in that little van, there is that doesn't exist. See, this is so interesting to me to hear because this is literally my wife and I's dream. Like we, we plan to do this and have every intent. We, we are constantly trying to, trying to decide what type of vehicle we would use to do this. And I love this family's choice of converting a shuttle bus. They did a, they did a really nice job. I, I, I agree that doing it with kids, I think would be miserable, but with my wife and I, uh, this is, I mean, when you ask the question, where would we play ball with our dog? Like everywhere. You know, like wh- you're going to be at a new place all the time and you're going to be in nature and the dog's going to love that. Now, I don't know if I would choose to do it with a pet, but uh, but yeah, man, we're we're constantly looking at RVs and vans and, and trailers. And I and- love my wife, but you two don't need like a separate space so she can do one thing. Like it's just see, being on top of each other constantly. It just feels like it would be. It would be too much. I think um, that's a good point. Uh, For a long time, my wife and I worked on very different schedules where I worked like nine to five and she worked uh, like an evening schedule. So it was like we never got to saw each other, okay. see each other. And I think that like we 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 like spending time together because of that, because we have fun on the weekends doing that. Uh, but yeah, we we think we could do a small space and still have separation. I mean, uh, I agree. Some spaces can get too small. Uh, but man, this is uh, especially visiting the national parks. That's the cherry on top. Because what a what a great route to take to just go to all the national parks. That'd be that'd be and, a dream. And despite what you see in most national parks, um, you know, advertising, going there with. A ridiculously huge RV is not usually the best way to go, unless you just park your RV in like the main campground and you have your little side by sides to run around. Um, if you have something a little more maneuverable, you're actually going to have a you're going to be able to see more. You're going to have a more. Yeah, we want time, which is what this vehicle. Oh, go ahead. We want something small enough where we have more options to park than just campgrounds because campgrounds aren't that pretty they aren't that nice uh and you're very close to people so we want the option to like you know park in nature or park you know stealth camp in on the side of a on a side street or something like that just a bunch of different options but yeah again i want to make it ex- abundantly clear i am not begrudging this family at all they for their rig looks very nice it's clearly working for them but it that i can tell and my wife agrees that is not something for us <laughs> i mean it's not for everybody yeah and I mean, I, I, I'm on the fence. We could we could do it for a while. I don't think we could do it for months. Yeah, they were. End. This trip was 18 months for them. We think uh, we think we could do it for a year. We don't think we could do it indefinitely. And we'd like to do it for more than like a week, like more than just a week. like we want to go out. And, and, you know, I work from home, so, you know, if, if we're still working, you know, hopefully we could keep that going too. But yeah, we want like this is this is our, uh, you know, uh dream goal retirement goal so i'll let you know if it happens okay <laughs> i'm sure we'll know yeah what's All right. so what was your top story of the week so so my top story um goes back to the mustang mach e because i find this vehicle fascinating 
And there was a story that came out. This uh, We sourced this from Cars Direct, which is a great site that uh, really follows the pricing of new cars and, and writes a lot about um, new car prices and incentives and things like that. So they found out that Ford is instructing its dealers to not advertise the Mustang Mach-E's price below the MR MSRP which sounds counterintuitive. Um, like they're not allowed to say, to like advertise a lower price than the MSRP. This is something dealers do all the time for every other car. Uh, but what it looks like they're trying to do is give the car shopper an experience closer to Tesla's where the price is just the price. And, you know, that if you go online and you build it, that it's going to be that price. But I think the problem is, is that even if they have that intent, Ford is saddled with the traditional dealer network and has already said in the fine print of the pre-orders for the Mustang Mach-E that the price that you configured for your pre-order is may not necessarily be the price you pay because the dealer will still negotiate the price with you. And that means that price could go down, but more likely it could go up, especially if demand for the Mach-E outstrips supplies. You know, dealers are going to do what dealers always do and start asking, you know, for $5,000 over MSRP and they're going to put a markup on it. Uh, but it, it sounds like, and this is the, the quote we had from Cars Direct, that the reason was to be competitive in the battery electric space by transacting in the way customers want to transact. And I read that as, they want to buy cars like they buy them from Tesla, where it's just like you're ordering an iPhone online from Apple. When I first read that, I thought, well, okay, you know, what's what's Ford's play here? They uh, they don't want people to get excited and come into the dealership. You're right, John. I I think that's a it's a direct line at Tesla. Uh, and and there's like you said, there's a lot of dealers that will advertise as soon as it, an incentive comes out. They might there might be three or four or five incentives on a certain model and a dealer will advertise a price with all of those incentives included. You go into the dealership saying, hey, I want to buy this car for this price. Oh, OK, well, do you qualify for this incentive? No. Do you qualify for this one? No. So inevitably, there's the bait and switch. They lure you in with a lower price and then they hit you with something higher. Ford it seems like they want to do the exact opposite. They want to bring you in with the car has whatever it is for MSRP. And then from there, oh, we have this incentive and this incentive. I, but is it going to work though? I mean, do you think it'll work? Well, so I think this is one of the reasons why the Maki is so interesting. If, if Ford can control its dealers to a certain extent to behave in a way they're not designed to behave, then I think this could be radical. Because if Ford can set up a buying experience for the Mach-E that mimics the Tesla experience where the price is just the price, you come in and you say, I want this model and I will pay you what you have advertised on the website. If they can somehow mimic that model on with the traditional dealers, that would be incredible because the traditional dealers, like I said, are, are not designed to do that. They are designed to uh, squeeze as much money out of you as possible, but also be able to advertise the lowest price possible just to get you in the door. And and that, but that's one of the reasons why people hate buying cars. And one mm. of the reasons that people rate buying a Tesla as really nice because it's nothing like that. Um, so I, it looks like Ford is is taking the steps to set up a Tesla like buying experience. But but when it begins, when it actually when they actually start selling, I just don't know how dealers are going to react. And I don't know what mechanism Ford has to make them kind of not act the way they're predisposed to act and to just sell the car for the price that Ford is advertising it for. I just it'll, it'll be it'll be an interesting thing to watch for sure, because we we've been talking about this a little bit earlier in our Slack chat Um why is it that the automotive buying experience hasn't evolved in the internet age like just about every other purchasing experience has? You still have this this just ancient, ridiculous kind of, you know, sleazy salesperson yeah. mentality going where it and, and it's just, you know, people you can you can sit down on the internet and you can do all your research and you know, all of these things that the, that the salesman is going to try to tell you. 
and it's just and you still it, have to go the, through it you still have to and go you still have to go through yeah. it all and well let me let me talk to my sales manager well let me do it and you know what it's it people's time it, it's just it's not worth it and it's just not worth it no matter um no matter how good other electric cars get compared to tesla no matter how good they get or how much they match a tesla in terms of range or innovation or all that or in terms of all the hardware and design the buying experience is something unique to tesla and an advantage that tesla has because they put a lot of effort and spent a lot of money and went through hell to make sure that they didn't have to sell cars the traditional way through the traditional dealership mm -hmm. model. And that is something completely unique to them. So if the other dealers or if the other automakers like Ford, and I, I've said this before, Ford is the only one with the Mach-E who's looked at Tesla and just said, they're clearly doing something right. Let's copy them wherever we can and it makes sense. And I think they're indicating that they want to copy Tesla in terms of the buying experience too. I just I just don't know if they have the ability or the levers to pull to force the dealers into that model. Um, yeah, that's yeah. the thing. Because I mean, no matter what happens, the Mach-E is still going to sell a fraction of what the F-150 sells. So I just wonder you know, what stick uh, Ford has to kind of punish the dealers to go along with whatever carrots they can try to use to get them along to go along with this. And, you know, another thing, I mean, this all depends on people actually wanting to buy the Mach-E. And that's and that's kind of where I differ, I think, from you guys a little bit still. I'm not convinced that Ford's going to sell anywhere near as, as many of these as they say. Yeah, the uh, the the or the first edition is sold out, but. Ford, why won't you tell us how many that is? Did you? Yeah, that's that's is, pretty. Is, weak. is it is it twenty five hundred? Is it thirty five hundred? Is it two hundred? You know, yeah. it's just it 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 seems like they're they're still trying to to bank on the uh uh you know bank on the whole this is this is different thing. But uh, also another so. another aspect of EV is that I think mainstream automakers have a huge problem with that they need to address that that pure EV makers like Tesla uh, don't is that traditional car dealers don't want to sell EVs because they make their money on service and mm -hmm. EVs require so little service that they're not going to provide that income to the dealers. And, and in case you didn't know, uh, dealers don't make a lot of money on each car sold. They make a lot of money everywhere else on the service and the warranties work and all of that stuff. So if they're selling cars that that you know have brakes that last you know ten times as longer and you know with no internal combustion engine, they just don't have the incentive to sell a lot of them. Um, I, I don't. I don't think, you know, this is the early days, and I think people who come in for a Mustang Mach-E aren't going to be persuaded to buy something else that's gas-powered. Like, they're probably going to come in because they want to buy that particular. Sure. But still, you, you know, traditional automakers are going to have to have this conversation with their dealers of like, look, this is our future. So rather than fight it, let's figure out how to make money off the EVs like we made and I off think that, the, uh, the gas-powered yeah. vehicles. That that could be the biggest challenge for Ford or other automakers going forward, because they have a dealer network. And when you look at some of these dealer networks, I mean, millions and millions and millions of dollars have been made by people not at Ford, just with their Ford dealership network. It and really they wield considerable political power on a local level, because oh, a lot of they times sure do. they're yeah. major donors to local politicians. You know, it doesn't matter if they're not contributing to the president or something like that but if you control the local people then you can kind of finagle things and yeah they're they've legally not just monopolized but they've codified the traditional dealership model into law across the united states and all 50 states and all these local municipalities i i think it's kind of i, I to me it's crazy that tesla has survived this long um a, as an independent automaker because if i were ford and I was looking at the future and seeing, you know, uh, EVs and having to convince my dealers to sell them. I would have thought, let me let me invest in Tesla. Let me become a partner. And then since Teslas do need a lot of service because Tesla doesn't have the greatest build quality, I'll let all my Ford dealerships be Tesla service centers. And I'll get Teslas coming in there to get fixed and they can buy floor mats and they can buy accessories like to me, everyone, all the automakers have been so threatened by Tesla that they've stepped away from the company. 
And if I were an automaker, I would be arguing that we need to get clo as close as possible to Tesla. We need to rub up against them and get some of that magic on us. And, and like I said, Ford has been the first to show any signs of kind of tipping their hat to Tesla and saying, you're doing something right and we're going to learn from that. Um, but yeah, they, they're, they're stuck in an old system. So we will, we will see, this is a, uh, this is going to, this is a car that's coming out by the end of 2020. So we've got a year to kind of figure these things out and see what Ford's going to do. All right. That brings us to the end of our show. Uh, you can follow Chris Smith on Twitter at CH writing. Uh, Chris Bruce at Chris Bruce 1985 and me at John underscore M underscore Neff. Uh, thanks for being on this week's podcast with me, guys. Always a pleasure. Great being here. And also thank you everyone out there for listening. We'll see you next week.